when I read the Quran, I, I didn't go into it with the mindset that I'm going to be mind blown. I went into it with the mindset that let me see what this has to say. And when I did that and I took away all my all like the, the, the fallacy I had in my head about how blown away I'd be to reading it actually for what it is. There was no two ways, but I, I, there, I couldn't do anything to, to figure out a way where women could be made an integral part of this enough to stay a part of it. Hi, my name's Noria. I am a second generation British Pakistani and I grew up in England in a moderate to conservative Sunni household. Um, and I'm qualifying to become like a human rights lawyer. Um, and I, for the purposes of the movement, will happily call myself an ex-Muslim. Uh, so I grew up in in England and my grandfather was like the, the gatekeeper, like, if, if you will, of the local mosque. Um, so I used to literally take such an interest and go with him, kind of, I, I would wear hijab, I'd go to Quran classes every evening after school. And it was very much part of my identity to the point where I even wanted to know beyond like the Arabic of the Quran and I, I carried a translation book with me. Um, and I was very like driven to show my outward identity as a Muslim. Um, and just because my grandfather was so proud of me as well, I would take part in like um, memorizing the Quran. And I was on my way to becoming like the female version of a Hafiz, if you will. But like I started trying to memorize uh, the ayats and then being able to recite them in like the most beautiful manner. Um, but this is like within our local community while I was younger. Um, so Islam very much like held a predominant like part of my identity while I was in the UK um, to the point where like even at school in RE I was chosen to like show demonstrate to the class how to read prayer and demonstrate namaz to them um, and I did that happily and I was like very very proud of it and um, I wouldn't leave the house like every morning I'd argue with my mom because like the pin of my hijab had to be perfect like bless her she dealt with so much but I wouldn't leave the house until it was like perfect and then I was I was only seven years old at the time but I did think that if this is what God has prescribed for us if this is what's like said then I should do it but when I did adorn the hijab and I you know I told my family and this is what I wanted to do at seven years old they kind of came back to me with, um, are you sure? Like, you're so young. You don't, Like, if you do this, it's really hard to come back from this. And I was shocked because I thought this is what God has prescribed. So instead of celebrating my decision, they're kind of just checking in on me. Um, whereas I feel like everybody should be doing this. If this is what God has said is the right thing to do, why are we not all adorning hijab? Um, and then obviously like down the line I became, I was a bit of a tomboy growing up so I played a lot of sports and just playing football and playing cricket and climbing, climbing frames with hijab becomes very impractical and cumbersome. Um, so eventually I did take it off um, and that all happened during, like while living in the UK where I felt like my identity was a very big deal um, because later I moved to Saudi Arabia and the hijab seemed like it was minuscule in comparison because obviously the state governs daily life and daily life is so religious be because of the state in itself so you don't need to kind of outwardly show your Muslim identity whereas I think in the UK I felt like I want to be seen as a Muslim woman and therefore like the hijab and all of these things are more important. Uh, for me Islam was just the inherent truth because it has it was what was passed down to me in in my family like there was no there was no alternative like it was just this is the god-given truth and this is what we abide by and this is what you should abide by and i i was like i was a curious cat even when i was younger and i would look at things and be like well god made dinosaurs then why did god make dinosaurs and 
um, like the answers I'd get were just he was testing his creation and things like that. And I, I would take that at surface level. I would accept it. I would be like, okay, that makes sense. He was testing creation. But then I would read the science and think, why was he testing his creation for like a million years to know that these these creatures can't you know, conform to his will or whatever. And then I was like, it seems a bit weird for an all-knowing, omnipotent creator to create creatures that just don't abide by his test, which is what's put on us humans. Um, so yeah, Islam was very much like a given. I There was no, there was no evidence-based anything that I was looking at to see. Like I would take the translations at face value. I would take the Quran at face value. I would, I would take the stories I was told if I'm having dinner with my entire family and you know, like I'm playing with my food or I'm messing around and my grandfather, my grandfather would tell me like, oh, you know, like the devil will come in in between and like, you know, just if, if, if you talk while you're eating, the devil will pee in your food and things like that. I would, I just took it face value. There was, there was nothing evidence-based. I feel like it was just passed on. And I, because we're living in like the UK, I wanted to hold on to as much as uh, of our identity as they held on to, which was obviously cultural as well. And, and, and patriotic and whatever, but a lot of it was deep rooted in Islam um, so I didn't question anything they told me. I just kind of took it at face value and like accepted it and and internalized it and just acted on within those realms. And I believing those things that they they very much believed. Um, like even going to the bathroom, for example, um, they would say that like there's an angel waiting outside, like recording your deeds. So like if for example, like I have lots of siblings, so you sometimes call out to your siblings, you know, like oh I I need this or whatever. And they would say like, that's so haram because the angel feels like you're finished in the bathroom, but you're not. So they're recording these bad deeds. And I was just a bit weirded out that like religion or God's like approval like seeps so deep into something so trivial. Um, but that's just something that was passed down. There was nothing in terms of evidence or anything that I lent towards to, to like, you know, um, consolidate my faith. Um, so we moved from Saudi Arabia back to, uh, sorry, to Dubai. And it seemed at the time like the perfect transition because I always knew I'd come back to England for university. Um, so where Dubai, where Saudi, for example, felt very restricted because I was growing up, I wasn't able to learn how to drive. Um, there's no such thing as cinemas. You're all just getting pir like pirated films, people are crossing the border to go to Bahrain to watch movies over the weekend. So all of those things started feeling very repressive. Um, the need to wear an abaya became more and more strict, the need to cover your head, um, things like that, the need to like meeting in mixed groups became very like you'd have to pick your specific spot and that just became very draining. Like at that age, you, you know, you you think that you're gonna have access to just being like a normal teenager as you would, and because I'd always come back to England, so I'd always have this as my reference point, um, which is where things are just a lot more normal. Um, but then moving to the UAE, um, it seemed like a good transition because women, for example, are allowed to drive. You don't need to wear the abaya. It, the, the cinemas, and that was a big deal coming from Saudi Arabia, like. This is like, okay, I'm at this age, this is perfect because now I can get behind a wheel, I can take off my abaya, I can go to the movies, I can interact with boys, like none of this is forbidden. Um, and then basically I came back to England for uh, university and when I moved back in 2015, um, I got married and a lot of it was due to like societal pressure because at a certain age, you can't be seen to be dating, especially in Pakistani culture. Like, it's either like you're married or you're, you're you know, you're not. Um, so I was kind of rushed into this marriage very early on. And um, like, it transpired like very soon after the honeymoon that kind of things went southwards and there was like emotional abuse, financial abuse. Um, uh, to the point where where there was a threat of physical abuse, I thought, okay, let me go back to my parents' house. 
Um, and in Dubai, for like all intents and purposes, moving from your husband to your father is like moving from one mahram, which is like a guardian in Islam, to another. So I had moved to my father's house and um, then I kind of like started to get my life back together and I found a new job. So one day on the way to work, I got a call from the Dubai police telling me that you have like a Dazaljia order on you. And I didn't know what this meant, but then I inquired like, what does this mean? What's a Da, what's a Dazaljia? And it's a forceful order so they can arrest you, but you have to forcefully return to your marital home, whether you're being abused or whether you're in fear of your life or anything. Regardless, you're essentially held hostage in, in your marital home. And I lived in Dubai a number of years, but obviously, like, I still thought that, you know, you know, jurisprudence holds up to this degree where you can't send somebody back to some, a place that they're fearful of, like, you can't hold somebody against their will. Um, so essentially, like I told my parents, and they were exactly on the same standing as me, that there is no way we're sending you back to that household, um, except in Dubai. There was a way um, if you have a very, very like conniving, cheeky lawyer, these elements of Sharia, which seem to be disposed of, still creep up in the UAE modern legal processes. And you can make use of these instruments. Um, and that's exactly what he did. So basically, he enforced this order on me, um, like citing disobedience. And at the time, like I'm, I'm obviously still a practicing Muslim, like I... I didn't know this had any affiliation to the to the Quran per se, um, but according to the police, I was disobedient in the sense that I had returned to my father's home without his permission. Um, and so according to them, they were able to arrest me um, and send me back forcefully. And the only way for me to answer no to being forcefully taken back was to initiate a divorce. Um, so obviously, like when you're going through something like this, you aim for, okay, I've separated from you, let's think of an amicable solution to fix this in the best way possible without going to court. Um, so while that was all transpiring, uh, a number of other like criminal induced cases were put on me for like theft and um, adultery, one of them, like he was stalking me for a long, long time. He was following me, he was looking at my new place of work, he was monitoring it, um, and the World Cup was going on, so we were all gathering as a group to watch the matches, and he had essentially spied on me. And basically, when the UAE police got to the point where, again, I thought I'm in an Islamic state where women's rights also count for something, I would go to them and I would tell them, like, I woke up this morning to like a potion of what looks like black magic concoctions outside of my house. They, they weren't interested. I was telling them I was like being followed. I was being, you know, stalked. I'm like, I feel like there's somebody constantly monitoring my house. I have photographic evidence um, because I was receiving like random threatening messages from delivery men, things like that. So you would assume that the, the police would do something to step in at this point because as a response to the Taos al put on you, you have no right as a woman to... to refuse the police besides initiating a divorce, which is exactly what I did. But they give you the condition of you can initiate this divorce, but you give up all your Islamic rights, right? So all the rights you would have to maintenance and things like that, which is entirely fine because at this point, all I cared about was my freedom. But this is a very important point in, in terms of like Islamic jurisprudence, like in, in the wider picture, uh, what it means for women, because apparently this is what the meher and all of that should safeguard but in this situation that because they put me into such a corner where they use the ta'a zawjiya and my only response was a no it means I had to forfeit all my rights which was still okay because my end goal was just the divorce but before that could even get registered in a court of law in Dubai you have to go through family counseling and this family counseling session was so heavily Islamic like influenced that you know to the point where I had I had absconded almost from this house which yes fair enough they can misconstrue